from Wish TV and Community Health Network. This is a Health Spotlight Town Hall Special. Well, good evening to you and welcome to Wish TV's Health Spotlight Special. And we're proud to partner once again with Community Health all this year to talk about some of the most important health topics in Indiana. And we want to spend the next hour talking about a topic that doesn't really get enough attention, but affects families throughout the state. That topic, infant and maternal mortality. And let's be honest, right off the top, Indiana is one of the worst states in the entire country on this issue. I want to show you some numbers right now. These are from 2020, the most recent statistics available that year. Indiana had 531 infant deaths. Mm -hmm. And according to the CDC, that's a 6.75 deaths per every 1,000 live births. Now that's the ninth worst rate in the United States. In that same year, the state reports 92 women died of pregnancy associated deaths. Eye opening numbers right there. We have two leading doctors from Community, Community Health Network here to answer uh, some questions for us over the next couple of hours. Ladies, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. We'll get to you in a moment, but first, we want to start this hour with what uh, the state and doctors throughout Indiana are doing to bring those numbers down. They've gathered today in downtown Indianapolis to talk about that. News 8's Cody Fisher spent the day with them. Hundreds of health care workers from around the state filled this ballroom downtown to learn about how they can improve infant mortality rates in their communities. This year's summit on infant mortality was branded Year of the Mom by State Health Commissioner Dr. Chris Box. If you don't start with a healthy mom, it's very difficult to have a good outcome for the pregnancy. Dr. Box says the state is working to create programs that reach women before they're pregnant. The idea is to educate them on contraception and their current health situations that could contribute to an unhealthy pregnancy. If we have moms that are mired in substance use disorder, if we have moms that have diabetes that are out of control, it increases congenital birth defects for babies. It increases the risk of them being very small, being born preterm, or having to be, be, be born preterm. In 2020 and 2021, Indiana saw an increase in infant mortality for African American families. Dr. Box says that's due in part because of the pandemic. Many people were frightened to go to the hospital, to the labor and delivery unit, or even their health care office because they were worried they were going to get COVID from a sick person. The Hoosiers state also continued to see a gap in infant mortality rates between white Hoosiers and Latino Hoosiers. It's very sad, you know, to see that. Reina Almanza is a Spanish translator for patients. She came to the summit to learn everything she can about the newest state programs so she can help close the gap in infant mortality in the Latino community. Our goal is to be able to communicate um, you know, resources and make sure that they have the same knowledge that everybody else has. Um, so we're constantly, um, you know, bringing those messages to them, what resources are available and uh, making sure that they also have access to those um, same equal resources in their um, language and not just, you know, in English, which a lot of them might not even speak. At the summit, Dr. Box also highlighted holes in the health care system for women in Indiana. 36 of our counties now do not have a hospital that has inpatient OB services. And that's very important because when you lose inpatient OB services, you frequently lose OBGYNs in your community, family doctors who do labor and delivery, and so you lose access to things like long-acting reversible contraception. The state is taking steps to try and fill those holes by creating a program for traveling medical professionals that provide care. Actual counties that have inpatient services to go out into counties around them that do not and have that advanced practice nurse or nurse midwife go out and deliver care closer to home. Dr. Box says the programs in place to bring down infant mortality are working. They just need to be expanded statewide to reach the most vulnerable communities. One of those programs will be coming in the new year. By May of 2023, we will have My Healthy Baby that's rolled out into every single county. So every woman covered by Medicaid, and that's over 50% of our deliveries now, if they desire to be connected to a family support provider or home visitor, they can have that opportunity. The Year of the Mom is also focused on the health of women over the span of several years after birth. We also are looking at things in maternal mortality, and we know that 31% of our moms in that three-year period died of overdose. So we have instituted more support for women with substance use disorder. Reporting in Indianapolis, Cody Fisher, Wish TV, wishtv.com, and follow us on Facebook. All right, so let's go ahead and welcome in our doctors from Community Health Network. Dr. Heather Benson is an OBGYN. She's a graduate of IU School of Medicine and has focused on complex genealogical surgery, the treatment of uterine fibroids, and 
helping African-American women improve their health, which is extremely important. And Dr. Alicia Harris is also an OBGYN and also a graduate of the IU School of Medicine. Ladies, good to see you. We have so much to talk about mm -hmm. this hour. First, though, we want to start with, with what exactly it is we're talking about, because a lot of our folks at home maybe aren't, aren't aware of how bad the problem is and, and if we can define it for them at home. Alicia, we'll start with you. So maternal mortality is defined as a maternal death that mm. occurs any time during pregnancy or in the postpartum period, that first year postpartum. And I'll let Dr. Benton define infant mortality. Yes, so infant mortality is the first year, um, any infant death that occurs within the first um, 12 months, mm. essentially. Um, is considered infant mortality. So it's that amount of time in, within that first year. It's amazing how you learn so much by having these conversations. Many people don't know that they should have these conversations. This is more than just women or children who die during birth. Um, the risks and the dangers are real in the months before and after the pregnancy? Yes, within the, I mean, we always talk about the first 12 months after birth um, within that postpartum period is really still a very high risk period of time. Um, and so we try to encourage our patients to, you know, continue to get ac active care, go to your appointments. Those things are very important so that we can kind of monitor them closely for any unusual signs that may develop. Mm. And, you want to expand upon that? Yeah, and I was just going to further emphasize with the statistic and actually some of the recent data that we have shows that about 37 of 37 percent of maternal deaths actually occur in the postpartum period in really? that first year after birth. Mm -hmm. So we, we heard some of the numbers before. Things are really bad here in Indiana. How do we how do we rank compared to other states and, and maybe why why is it so bad here? Yeah, we're in, we're not doing great <laughs> currently. Um, currently, of all the states that report this data nationally, Indiana is ranked third highest wow. um, with maternal mortality. Mm. That's the last thing a mother wants to hear yeah. in this yeah. state. That's it's very scary. scary. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is Gosh. scary stuff. But I'm sure we'll be able to dive a little bit more into mm -hmm. you know, what people should know and what they can do. We have so many more questions for you, ladies. Sit tight. We'll be back to you in a moment. We, we also um, want to have a, another voice here from Wish TV that we talk to quite often, Wish TV medical expert and former Surgeon General, Dr. Jerome Adams. He's with Wish TV multicultural reporter, Tara Winfrey. So Dr. Adams, when we talk about maternal mortality rates, are there any groups or people who are most at risk? Uh, yes, there are. We know that uh, black women and American Indian and Alaska Native women are at much higher risk than, for instance, white women and, uh, and uh, even uh, Asian American women and Hispanic women. We also know that women who have a lower educational status are um, at higher risk than women who have higher educational status, meaning they've graduated from high school, they've gone to college and have a college degree. Interestingly enough though, a black woman with a college degree still has a higher risk for maternal mortality than a white woman who's dropped out of high school. So those racial differences sometimes uh, are so much, so much greater uh, for certain groups that they cancel out even the value of a higher education. But one final group that is at higher risk uh, includes women who are older. And we've seen more women uh, choosing to have babies at an older age, and that is a risk factor. That puts you at higher risk. And so we want those women to know that it's, it's especially important that they get prenatal care, um, that they are um, being uh, conscious of their their blood pressure, their blood sugar, and risk factors. And we know that uh, the risk that goes up with age, again, goes up more so for black women than for any other group. So you bring up your work as the Surgeon General to kind of help spread awareness. And in the last few years, we've really seen awareness grow when it comes to maternal mortality rates. But when we talk about Indiana, specifically about Indiana, it's one of the worst states. Um, what do you think is causing that? What do we think is causing that? Well, that's a great question. It's important to understand that Indiana actually ranks pretty low on most health rankings, and we also rank pretty low on public health spending. We spend about $55 per person on public health uh, in Indiana compared to a national average of about $90 per person. Why does that matter to maternal health and maternal mortality? Well, you aren't gonna be healthy when you're having a baby if you aren't healthy throughout your life course. And so the, the uh, rankings that I mentioned uh, actually 
uh, play into how much are we go contributing to a healthy childhood? How much are we doing to help teenagers and young women uh, be their healthiest selves before they decide to get pregnant? And unfortunately, far too women, by the time they become pregnant in Indiana, are already unhealthy. They're already uh, diabetic. They already have high blood pressure. They already have risk factors which lead to negative outcomes. And then additionally, that lower spending uh, that Indiana puts towards health compared to other states is reflected in our health care systems. And we know that uh, unfortunately far too many women when they go into the hospital with problems when they're pregnant aren't appropriately cared for. So a report from the Indiana Department of Health listed clinical and quality of care as key factors that weigh in on the disparities when it comes to maternal health. Now, does that have anything to do with the health of a woman before they come in for delivery versus how they live on a day to day? Well, that is a great question, and it's important to understand that the Department of Health was speaking about the care individuals receive from the hospital system. That's one big part of this. We need to make sure if you are at higher risk that you are uh, able to get into a facility that has experience caring for someone who has higher risk. Too many high-risk women are sent to facilities that aren't able to appropriately care for them, and that leads to negative outcomes. But as you mentioned, there are factors related to the individual and not just the healthcare system. Uh, are you diabetic? Do you have high blood pressure? Uh, do you have other risk factors? And those individual decisions that people make are impacted by the communities in which they uh, live, learn, work, play, and pray. So does your job site provide opportunities for you to breastfeed? Do you live in a neighborhood that has sidewalks so that you can go out and exercise, which will lower your chance of cardiovascular disease and diabetes? All of these are different factors which play into our individual and our collective or community risk for negative health outcomes. And unfortunately, certain subgroups of people, people of lower income, people of color, um, uh, they, people with, of lower educational status tend to find themselves in situations more often where they are at higher risk for negative, uh, negative outcomes. You can't be healthy when you're pregnant if you're not healthy before you're pregnant. So we need to look at this uh, in terms of the entire lifespan. We need to make sure young girls are healthy. We need to make sure they're receiving age-appropriate sex education. We need to make sure they're learning to advocate for themselves when they're elementary and middle schoolers uh, so that when they become women, they're comfortable speaking up. Uh, and then when they become of the age that they decide that they're going to get pregnant, they're going to be in a much better position. But we can't magically take someone when they show up in the doctor's office, uh, you know, several weeks or sometimes several months pregnant, and then turn them into a healthy person if they haven't been healthy for the last um, 18, 25, 30 years of life. I think that's a great point to continue yeah. the conversation with Dr. Benson and Dr. Harris. You know, we just heard Dr. Adams talk about the connection between you know, your maternal health and your overall health from your childhood. Mm -hmm. And I just keep thinking about the holidays and how we're sure. about to be around our tables and <laughs> eating all of our cultural foods and having the conversations with our aunts and uncles who might not have been taking the best of care of themselves. <laughs> you know, this is a big conversation we should be having with our family. So let's talk about that. What do we need to know and what do we need to be asking our loved ones to make sure that we're, you know, healthy, especially since it might be things that have been there since we've been children. Sure. I think this, a discussion of just that, your family health history is important. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's something that we don't really do um, in, gen in this generation as much as we should. We more so are relying on medical records that are electronic and things like that instead of having conversations with our loved ones about what they've experienced. Um, women who have family members that have a history of chronic hypertension are more likely to have chronic hypertension coming into pregnancy, develop complications of that during pregnancy, such as preeclampsia. Also, women who have a family history of diabetes are more likely to experience gestational diabetes during mm. pregnancy. So I think it's very important that you know what the risk factors are so that you can be aware of them, mindful of them, and look out for those symptoms as they present so you can communicate that to your physician. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. how, how much of, the, of this problem is, is 
lifelong as opposed to maybe new issues that arise, Doc? I mean, I think this is definitely a lifelong um, issue that we talk about, right? Because a lot of times in our, you know, line of work, we talk about preconception counseling as well. You know, mm -hmm. what, um, what does your lifestyle look like before pregnancy? What does your lifestyle look like in the postpartum period after, you know, the baby is here? And now we have to look at your weight. How much weight have you gained throughout the pregnancy? exercise programs, things of that nature. Um, what are you consuming? How many calories? Things like that. So I think it's definitely a lifelong thing, not just within the first 12 months postpartum that we all, you know, desperately care about, but actually continuing this process so that we are creating healthy lifestyles and healthy patterns for our patients. You were speaking my language. I love when we talk about <laughs> having a plan, okay? Right. And a lot of people are afraid to have a plan, right? But mm -hmm. let's also talk about something that's near and dear to Indiana's heart, and it's obesity. And we've seen these rates be pretty much rampant throughout our state. So yeah. how do we have those conversations? Because that is a big issue when you're trying to get pregnant and then mm -hmm. you talk about the cultural components to that. Mm -hmm. How should we be talking about that in our in our homes and what should we be doing? I would say it's important to be mindful of your weight going into pregnancy because you're going to further gain weight when you become pregnant. Yes. As the blood volume expands, as you are just consuming more calories and maybe not quite as active as you were into pregnancy, mm -hmm. it's bound to happen. And so I typically counsel patients that the average of weight gain is about 40 pounds, but statistically in Indiana, it's about 60. Mm. Wow. So a lot of times you wanna prepare your body for pregnancy. Try to get down to that ideal weight so that if you were to gain 40 pounds, would you be very unhappy? Or would you be increasing your risk for hypertension, preeclampsia, mm -hmm. diabetes, if you were 60 pounds heavier than your pre-pregnancy weight? So I think it's a sensitive subject and sometimes women shy away from discussing weight, but it's very important because obesity definitely decreases all of the healthcare outcomes that are very important to us, especially when we look at cesarean section rate, which is much higher for mm -hmm. women who are obese, mm -hmm. preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, as I mentioned, all of those things are more likely to affect women who are higher in weight going into pregnancy. How quickly, though, can you reverse the, this going forward? Like, let's say you're, you're somebody, you're thinking about getting pregnant a couple of years out, how quickly can you, can you reverse it? You get on a good um, fitness program, you mm -hmm. start eating, will that, re if, and you do get down to the, the proper weight, will that reverse the possible effects that can happen if, if things are to occur, to occur during pregnancy? Yes, um, I think that's a resounding yes, because any time that you are starting from a healthier standpoint or healthier um, beginning, you're going to have better results as you progress through, whether it's in pregnancy or just in life in general. You know, as uh, Dr. Harris was talking about, decreasing your risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, all of those things kind of group and run together. So obesity, if we can get weight down, um, I think it's gotta be a very open and honest conversation. I think we have that with our patients all the time. We don't shy away from it. You just have to come straight out and say, let's, let's talk about your weight. Let me see how I can help you so that you can be the best you and your best lifestyle and your skin. It takes a village, right? I know yeah. a couple of my girlfriends, mm -hmm. we have sweat checks because a couple of them are getting ready to start their families. What's that? Sweat, sweat checks. Sweat? Oh, okay. So that way, you know, just to make sure okay. that they're working out. Right. You oh, know good. Me. Yes. Okay. I don't like to sweat. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's, it's interesting. We're talking about a village. We're talking about knowing our communities. Uh, Dr. Adams spoke about this, and Katir kind of was getting into this as well, of getting pregnant at more seasoned, I won't say older, I I'll say seasoned right. ages. <laughs> yes. uh, and what that means in different communities. I mean, we've had this conversation about, you know, racial disparities mm -hmm. when it comes to health care. I want to go back to the numbers from the Indiana Department of Health here. These are the pregnancy associated deaths rates over the last three years that we have numbers on. The maternal mortality rate for black women is 40 percent higher mm. than for white women and two and a half times more than Hispanic women. When you hear these numbers, one, does it surprise you? And two, I know a lot of my girlfriends who are, are women of color are getting pregnant at later and later ages because of their family home makeup, because of their careers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does all that go into what we just saw with those numbers? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, so first with speaking on age, as you mentioned, a lot of people are delaying childbearing because look at the economy. It's very expensive to have a child. Yes. Yes. And also women are very... That was a little louder than the Quickly, before you I know. And women are career-oriented and driven and want to accomplish a lot of things before they decide to maybe shift their focus on um, raising a family. But with delaying childbearing, and, you know, I'm of an age you won't speak of, but coming up to the big 4-0. Oh. No. And, um, yeah. Never guessed. <laughs> it's Thank the melanin. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and a lot of my friends are having babies because, you know, this is just the time in their life where they're starting to feel settled and, and that's a change that they want to make. But with that, they know that they're at a higher risk for developing, especially preeclampsia, mm -hmm. which tends to present in the, its most severe state at the extremities of age. So for the young African-American teenagers and the older women that are greater than 35 years of age seem to present with a more acute disease process and a more severe disease process. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a definite contributor to these poor healthcare outcomes that we're seeing with this racial disparities is that black women tend to be affected by preeclampsia at higher rates than white women and definitely with more severe forms. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that they need to have a very special relationship with their physicians? Because it sounds like this is a journey for all women. I mean, because we have some seasoned women right here in this building who are going <laughs> yeah. through these journeys. <laughs> and it just seems like, you know, you see people talking about doulas, you see so many things. I mean, how do they, um, advocate for themselves knowing what we just saw on that screen. Yeah, I think it's uh, a multifactorial approach, if I can say that. Um, I think, number one, you, you asked about the, the connection or the relationship, very close connection and relationship with their physicians, especially their OBGYNs, but also their primary care physicians and the other physicians that are interacting with their care. That's number one. Um, with the more seasoned women, a lot of times we will refer them to the maternal fetal medicine specialists so that they can be on board with, you know, doing certain ultrasounds, making sure that, you know, baby is growing appropriately, yeah. making sure blood pressures are good and things of that nature. So um, I think all within that, um, in addition to their primary care docs and, and, and us as well, are, are going to be very important relationships to kind of help foster that. Teamwork makes the dream work. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a good conversation, ladies. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We'll get back to it in a moment after the break. And we'll be back with our doctors from Community Health to talk about infant mortality next on this Health Spotlight Special. You're watching Wish TV, Indiana's only statewide TV news network. Health Spotlight, presented by Community Health Network. And welcome back to our Wish TV Health Spotlight special. Tonight's topic, infant mortality. And we touched on this earlier, but State Health Commissioner Dr. Christina Box says the data on infant mortality in Indiana clearly shows disparities among race. She says despite the state having its lowest infant mortality rate in its history in 2019, that rate ticked back up the very next year. And the reason why is clear. Because the non-Hispanic black rate went, went up. So what we're doing is working. But we need to consistently make sure that every woman across the state has the opportunity to be able to avail themselves of the structures that we've put in place, the programs and policies that we have in place to help them have a successful pregnancy in at least the first year of that baby's life. Why? Is, sorry, uh, why, why did you guys see those disparities increase again after years of them going down? So it, mostly what we see is two things. Number one, unsafe sleep situations where babies are put to bed sometimes on their stomach or with blankets or with in the bed with other children or adults. And the second thing is our highest risk is perinatal um, mortality and morbidity and that's really related to preterm birth. So when babies are born very early, they frequently have overwhelming respiratory distress, they can have problems uh, with parts of their bowel dying, they can have sepsis which is infection throughout their body and that oftentimes takes their life. Well, there we have it. Dr. Mm -hmm. Box says what the state is doing to lower infant mortality is working, but she also says that the rate went back up because the non-Hispanic black rate went up as well. So is it working for everyone is really the question. I think there's, it, it's working, but there's always room to improve. And I think what, what I see is the highlight that I would take away from this whole concept is we're working and we're trying, right? It, we know that it's not the same for non-Hispanic blacks 
or Hispanics um, or minorities, any woman of color, we know that there are inequalities. But I think being able to identify that and address that up front and have a open dialogue and discuss it is one of the key steps to being able to move forward and really truly hit home on how we can improve this. She mentioned a couple of, of a couple of reasons why they were in that in that interview. Are there any others that maybe we, we didn't point out tonight so far that, that you want to get into tonight? Yes, so we have the social determinants of health, yes. which are of course, you know, access to health care, right. transportation, access to healthy foods, um, a access to a healthy environment to be, you know, nurtured and supported in. All those things. And some people at home, and I don't mean to cut you off, might be like, well, yeah. how does that play a role? So expand upon that a little bit because it, it totally does. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So it definitely just contributes to a patient's overall wellness and sense of well being. Especially when you think about someone who's diabetic or hypertensive. If they have, a f they live in a food desert and they're having difficulty accessing the healthy foods uh -huh. that they need, that is going to decrease their likelihood of having a great outcome. Mm -hmm. And so when you ignore the social determinants of health, you're truly ignoring a great opportunity to improve that patient's wellness and increase their outcomes for them and their baby. I feel like we've been having this conversation for years, but I feel like the fervor behind this conversation has just grown, especially after the mm -hmm. pandemic and people really um, wanting to take control of their health and their wealth. You know, when we talk about closing this disparity gap, what else can we do? There's several things that we can do. First of all, like Dr. Benson mentioned, just to be mindful of it, you know, to know that there are disparities, they exist, and for providers in particularly to, to recognize that we all have biases and mm -hmm. to recognize those and to maybe listen um, with with a, a more unbiased ear and and pay more attention to small details in certain patient populations than you know things you might overlook or not ask about for a mom that resides in Fishers you know so to be more strategic um, and more objective in how we deliver health care is important and I also think that we can optimize you know our supportive networks and ancillary staff to also improve patient outcomes you want to yeah it's, the biggest thing she said was the listen I mean mm. it's really listening I feel like we hear that all the time, mm -hmm. oh, you're the first physician that listened to me. Mm. Um, it's, it's a resounding thing that we hear over and over again. So listening is very, very important. Well, as we talk about infant mortality, let's talk about breastfeeding yeah. real quick because mm -hmm. that is a journey of its own. Yes. Uh, I, <laughs> I've never had to do it just yet, but I know a lot of my friends have had many different journeys. Would breastfeeding help with infant mortality if you're able to do it? What's the relationship like with that journey? Yes, we have statistics that show that um, babies that are fed for a longer duration of time, breastfed, mm -hmm. are, have lower rates of infant mortality. So I think it's, there's, that's for several reasons. That bonding, that connection, the attention that you're paying to your child when you have to wake up many times throughout the night to um, provide breast milk or to act as a pacifier to mm -hmm. your infant. Um, so yes, we definitely have data to support that, but breastfeeding is very time consuming. It can be painful. It can mm -hmm. be frustrating. So it's important that we have resources to support patients, to provide them with knowledge, mm -hmm. um, and so that it, that support doesn't stop the moment they leave the hospital with the newborn, mm -hmm. because it's definitely a journey. And as that child grows, that relationship changes in breastfeeding, you know, that relationship will change as well. For the people mm -hmm. who cannot breastfeed, or maybe they're just, you know, they're like, look, this is just not working. What should they be doing to help as far as when we're talking about infant mortality and giving their baby the best shot? Yeah, I think a lot of the same things that Dr. Harris mentioned. I mean, you know, I always say a, a fed baby is most important. So for those moms that, you know, aren't able to breastfeed, I always say, you know, this isn't a, about mom shaming or anything like that, right? It's important that you're spending time with your baby. You know, you can still provide love and care for your baby and, you know, feed with formulas and things. Some babies have, you know, special needs where they're not able to um, tolerate certain formulas. So, you know, as long as you're providing that nurturing 
um, care as best as you can. You know, all you have to be is what we say is a good enough mom, right? Mm -hmm. No one has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. You just have to do your best, and that that's all we really can ask. That should be a T-shirt. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> yes. Ladies, thank you very much. Stick with us. Coming up, uh, we're going to talk much more about the role of mental health in mothers and what some doctors are now calling the fourth trimester of pregnancy. Health Spotlight, presented by Community Health Network. And welcome back to this Wish TV Health Spotlight special as we focus on infant and maternal mortality. We want to dive deeper right now into maternal mortality and the role of mental health. So let's turn again to Wish TV medical expert and former U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Jerome Adams. We cannot afford to dismiss the significance of mental health as it relates to physical health. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you're misusing substances, uh, you're not going to be able to be healthy physically um, as a result of not being healthy mentally. And we see that play out when it comes to maternal morbidity and mortality, suicide attempts, um, a postpartum depression, uh, and, and even situations like family struggles at home, domestic violence. It's a stressful time when you come home with a new baby. The baby's not sleeping, um, husband and wife end up getting into it. These mental health issues are things that we need to recognize as, as clinicians and as healthcare systems and that we need to have resources available to uh, be able to, to intervene so that we can put women in a better position to be healthy themselves and for them to raise healthy babies. I know a lot of times, even today, people can often look at mental health support still as a bit taboo. It might, it's still very much stigmatized. How can families or women advocate for themselves to say, you know what, I'm not feeling that great. I might need some help. Mental health is truly something that's stigmatized. And I say this as an African-American man, particularly so in the African-American community. What we need to do is normalize mental health as part of our overall health, spiritual health, mental health, physical health. They all lead into us being our best selves. And so uh, there are initiatives like the Colts um, Kicking the Stigma campaign that are helping to normalize positive mental health and wellness by showing these big, strong football players, these celebrities, as talking about their struggles with mental health issues and how they overcame them. That's one thing that we can do. But another thing we can do is encourage clinicians, doctors, nurses, midwives, to screen women for mental health concerns at every visit. Why does that help? Well, it makes it as normal as getting your blood pressure taken. You, you don't balk at your doctor saying, hey, we're gonna take your blood pressure today, or we're gonna weigh you today, because that happens every doctor's visit. It's normal. We need to make it normal for your doctor to be asking you about how you're feeling. Are you anxious? Are you depressed? Are you uh, having marital troubles at home? And if we do that, then we will be able to pick up problems earlier, we'll be able to apply evidence-based treatments to those problems, and we'll save more lives. And we're back now with Dr. Harris and Dr. Be uh, Dr. Benson. Um, Dr. Adams talked about the fourth trimester. What exactly is that, Dr. Benson? So we always talk about the fourth trimester. That's the period of time after, you know, mom has delivered baby, but it's still very early in that postpartum period. Um, as we, you and I, are, we were talking earlier, you know, it's a very, very important period of time, not just, you know, within the first 12 months, but to really hone in on any symptoms that mom may be having, um, making sure you're paying attention to her, her mental well-being. Postpartum depression is huge, mm. especially within that first, well, the fourth trimester, that first period after uh, moms have babies. So you have um, postpartum depression, you have the baby blues, things of that nature. So I do think it's important, as Dr. Adams mentioned, to make sure that we are really addressing mental health with our moms um, just routinely, making it mm -hmm. a routine thing that we talk about. Do you see mental health being overlooked when you are meeting with your patients? I mean, I feel like we talk about mental health so sure. much nowadays, but is it still being overlooked? Yes, I, I think that there's definitely still room for improvement. Mm -hmm. We've gotten better with recognizing that it is a problem and it definitely needs to be addressed. 
but we can always improve. And I think, like Dr. Adams mentioned, looking at it more so as like a vital sign. So yes. that is less taboo to talk about will go a long way. It's, it's similar to obesity where it can sometimes be the elephant in the room. Mm. It can be mm. a major, major factor in affecting a woman's healthcare outcomes, but still she doesn't feel open bringing it up to her clinician and saying, this is something I'm struggling about. I'm having these suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. I constantly feel anxious because it can be viewed as a sign of weakness or not being a great mom. And I think that women have to be as accepting of the fact that no one's perfect and we mm -hmm. all need help mm -hmm. and a lot of times these things have hormonal contribute contributors and then sleep deprivation is huge yes. on your Absolutely. mood and so someone can might you know maybe don't feel quite like their normal self but maybe a little shy about expressing that but it's very important how do you go about that as a doc because it's a tough conversation to have I would imagine so how do you go about as a doctor from a doctor's perspective having that conversation and making sure that you're being heard Mm -hmm. I simply just put it out there and say, how are you feeling? No, really, how are you feeling? Is motherhood what you thought it would be? Do you feel like you're the mother you thought you would be? Are you struggling with any area of this? Are you sleeping? Are you taking time to eat? Are you taking time to shower? Are you taking time to exercise? And usually with asking those questions, in the context of like a friend having a conversation, mm -hmm. patients typically open up and let me know how they're truly doing. I hope that mm -hmm. there are people out there who are writing those questions down because these are questions that mm -hmm. I think a lot of women wish that someone would just ask because they don't want to bring it up themselves. Also, what have you seen, especially with your, with your patients, their relationship between also needing to ask for maybe mental health help and it coinciding with their faith? Because sometimes people think mm -hmm. that they have to pick one or the other. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that with your clients? I think culturally, especially you know, as, as black women, as black people, um, it is very much at times a stigma to ask for mental health help because mm -hmm. you know, often we say, God will, God will fix it. I'm just going to pray mm -hmm. about it and then hope that, you know, things get better. And my response is always, you know, God puts people in your life to help okay. you at the same time, right? So he put us together in this relationship. So it's something that um, reaching out um, is important. And I always say, just as much as I care about your physical health, I care equally about your mental health and try to just encourage them in that way. And it, just as Dr. Harris was saying, you know, being able to ask those open-ended questions and just get the flow of the conversation going and, and that usually helps things along. Mm -hmm. From How a powerful conversation uh, Yes, and from a viewer's perspective, if they do have a doctor out there that maybe isn't bringing up these conversations, how do you recommend uh, the viewer or the patient go about bringing this up? Mm -hmm. I would maybe start the conversation with saying, you know, there are some things that I notice that are different for me, mm -hmm. that make me think that something isn't quite right. Mm -hmm. And when I hear those words from any patient about anything that says, I feel like something is wrong, I don't feel like my normal self, mm -hmm. something's not right, I immediately stop, mm -hmm. immediately mm -hmm. stop. Because no one knows you better than you. And so for a patient to tell me, I feel like something's not right, there's definitely something that's not right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that will definitely start the conversation and grab their provider's attention, and they'll get the time that they need. A lot of people, when they hear about, you know, a mom that just gave birth or anybody who has a newborn, they immediately go to postpartum, mm -hmm. um, which is a big deal. But have we, when do we know that we've reached the issue where it's maybe past postpartum, where it's not just the mommy blues? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think usually duration of time helps to clarify that. I mean, if you're, you know, it's been several weeks, you've been having the exact same feelings, you know, your um, anhedonia, you're not feeling like doing the things that you used to enjoy doing, you know, feelings of guilt, um, sadness, um, feeling overwhelmed, things like that. If you um, notice yourself feeling those feelings, then, you know, and it's been a while since you've given birth, then yes, that usually is a signal to maybe this is something a little bit more and it warrants um, you know, further investigation by your physician. Are some of your patients open about that? I mean, because like we said, it's sometimes a difficult conversation to have. Yeah, I, I think you know, it's about how you develop the relationship mm -hmm. when you start 
your encounter with your patients, whether it's yeah. a brand new patient or a patient that you've been seeing for years. Um, a lot of times the ones you've been seeing for years, it's a little bit easier to yeah. have that open conversation. But even the newer patients, it's all about how you set the stage and how you um, create an environment that's open and welcoming for your patients to feel comfortable being able to talk to you about that. So I think it's very doable. It sometimes just warrants a little bit extra um, push on our parts as physicians. Mm. Mm. Being aware of yourself, paying attention to yourself. I want to give you some more numbers here again from the state and this time on substance abuse and maternal death. There were 92 pregnancy associated deaths in Indiana in 2020. Of those substance abuse disorder was the most common factor contributing to 43% of deaths. In fact, 28 of the deaths are listed as a result of a drug overdose. Mm. Eye opening. Man, eye -opening so opening eye opening. Numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, when you see these numbers, what, what goes through your mind? Obviously, you're, you're, you're well aware of this stuff, but yeah. I don't think our viewers were aware of how eye-opening this was. So what are your, your takeaway when it comes to that? I mean, I, it's heartbreaking. When you, when you see those statistics, it's truly heartbreaking um, because so many women are suffering from substance use disorder, right? Um, and there could be various reasons, traumas, childhood traumas, past traumas, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, you know, they got into something early on when they were younger in their teen years mm -hmm. and they developed a habit. Usually people that are suffering from substance use disorder, they're not, um, their goal is not to be utilizing that substance. It turns into a, um, a very physiological thing where their brain is requesting or requiring that substance. They will do whatever they need to do in order to be able to obtain that substance to get themselves feeling back to how they think normal is mm -hmm. on the substance mm -hmm. yes. but that's where we come in because we know that's not the case we know that these are women these are mothers these are sisters cousins mm -hmm. you know it's somebody someone important in their life and so we don't look at the substance we look at the person and our goal is how can I help you as a person to see yourself the way I see you, so that we can help to get you, you know, not relying on the substance, but relying on other resources, relying on relationships, so that we can get them to a better place, whether they are pregnant or outside of pregnancy. What do you say to a mother who knows that she is struggling with substance abuse, but is very nervous and very afraid of the stigma that comes with that, mm -hmm. and maybe some of the consequences that could come with telling someone, hey, I'm still struggling, but I really want to take care of my baby? Mm -hmm. Right. Again, it's a very taboo subject, and it's something that sometimes providers don't inquire about because they don't even really want to know the answer because they may not have available resources that they feel are adequate to really help their patient. But I think it's, it's very important to um, have a provider that you have a comfortable relationship with that you know won't judge you and wants the best for you. Mm -hmm. and. Um, at Community, we have a program called the Choice Program. Yes, we're going to get into that yeah, yeah. right now, actually. Uh, one of the programs, as you mentioned, the Tree Pregnant Women, the Choice mm -hmm. Program for Substance Abuse. Uh, at Community Health Network, it stands for Change, right? Mm -hmm. Hope, Overcome, mm -hmm. Inspire, Compassion, and Educate. And we, we want to talk to our doctors about that in a second. But first, Community Health did uh, let us hear from Kay, one of the women who had benefited from that program. Listen. Really nervous about, like, if actually being pregnant would like be like triggersome in a way, you know? It was really refreshing. You go in there and you got like three people coming up to you and they're like, hey, how you doing? You know, and it was just like very refreshing and very um, encouraging. All of y'all have been extremely personal. Like you can tell every single person that walks in there, you know who they are, you know what's going on with them and you're 100% there for them. And that's like something that like us addicts like need. You know what I mean? Like we don't think we do, but we do. You know, like support is a very big thing and you guys are extremely supportive. I am doing what's right for me. And in the long run, yeah, they can raise their eyebrow at you, but what's a raised eyebrow really going to affect your day? You know you're doing right. Then it gets a little bit easier. It's just like drug addiction, you know what I mean? Like, as soon as you accept you have a problem, you know, you can actually start to work on it. It doesn't, I mean, it makes it easier, but you're not, like, literally fighting with it anymore. If anyone's struggling with it, like, just take it as, like, a something to run with, you know what I mean? Rather than let it like really bug you because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It only matters what you think and what you're doing for your kids, you know? You know, it's always very helpful to hear from someone who's actually gone through the program. Let's go ahead and talk about the Choice Program. What specifically are we talking about for treatment? Because this isn't just, it's really more than just beating the immediate effects of addiction, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So in the Choice Program, um, so it's it's very uh, flourishing right now at Community East. That's where, where I am. Um, and so it's really all about um, taking women that are you know struggling with this and helping them through it. So a lot of times during pregnancy, we use um, a substance called Subutex, um, and we help to um, wean you know mothers off of their su suffering from opioid addictions and things of that nature. We have other medications, Suboxone and things of that nature for postpartum after pregnancy. So this program really does try to wrap their arms around the patients as soon as they're coming in, you know, new pregnant moms, um, all the way through to the postpartum period and after, and we try to make sure that we're, you know, hooking them up with different resources, whether it's transportation, um, whether it is housing and things of that nature. We are trying to make sure that we are helping them to meet the needs that they have when they aren't able to do it for themselves. Yeah. And one of the key things that we heard from Kay there was not being judged, mm. Doctor. Oh, How yes. important is that? It's definitely important because you're more likely to be transparent and honest if you have a relapse or there's something that's going on in your life that can contribute to a poor outcome for you if you feel comfortable and you feel like you wouldn't be judged. And so that's a, something that's of great emphasis with the Choice Program. I know Community Health really wants to expand this program to include you know, more women of color. How do we get that message out there? And What makes women of color more hesitant to take part in a program like this, or is it that they just don't know about it? I, I think some of it is that they don't know about it. I think we have to do more on our end um, as physicians and you know other uh, staff, ancillary staff that are involved. It's really getting out, going out on the street, going out to the the shelters, going out to um, you know these establishments, and being able to talk to women about what we offer. I think if more people know what's out there what are the resources that are available, then they'll be able to take part in those. So um, that's something that we, we definitely will continue to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ladies, good conversation. Uh, we'll have much more on this conversation coming up after the break. Stick with us. You're watching Wish TV, Indiana's only statewide TV news network. Health Spotlight, presented by Community Health Network. And welcome back to this Wish TV Health Spotlight special as we focus on infant and maternal mortality. The question now, uh, what do we do next and what needs staff? So let's go ahead and go back to those state numbers one more time. The state of Indiana believes that of the pregnancy associated deaths in 2020, health authorities believe 80% four out of every five had at least some chance of being prevented. Mm. That includes more than have with a good chance of prevention. So what should happen now in Indiana? We put that question to Wish TV medical expert and former U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Jerome Adams. So I know there are benefits to going to facilities that are deemed high clinically or have good ratings, but there's so many stories that are coming out where people go to these great hospitals and they end up passing away while giving birth. So that idea of a quality facility kind of goes out of the window. What do you say to doctors, to patients, to try to ensure their safety when they go in for delivery? One of the things that is most disturbing about maternal mortality rates in this country is that when you have someone like a Beyonce or a Serena Williams who has all the money in the world and the access to the best doctors and they still have negative pregnancy outcomes, it tells you that there's something else going on there. There's something about being a woman of color that puts you at higher risk for negative outcomes no matter how much money you have, no matter how nice the facilities are you're going to. And so uh, the CDC, when I was Surgeon General of the United States, worked with me to put out the Hear Her campaign. And the Hear Her campaign is all about uh, highlighting the fact that we need to listen to women, and particularly women of color, when they tell us something is wrong. We need to answer their questions. We need to get them the care that they need. And uh, that starts with helping empower those women, helping them learn the signs and symptoms and, uh, and, and encouraging them to speak up. But it's also about talking to their families and saying, hey, they just had a new baby. They're stressed. Um, it's up to you to also be looking out for those signs and symptoms. It's also about talking to hospital systems and having systems in place to recognize bias uh, because we, we all carry bias uh, with us. It's how we learn that bunnies are safe and lions aren't. That's bias. We don't have to 
think through the process. It's something that instantly we know. But bias can be bad when it causes us to make decisions that aren't supported by the evidence. And that happens far too often for black women. And that leads to negative outcomes when it comes to maternal mor mortality and morbidity. And those are great points to get to, Dr. Benson, Dr. Harris. What are one, what's one thing that you want to leave our viewers with after all of these amazing conversations? <laughs> I would say come in and talk with your physician. We will listen. We are here to listen. Um, you know, don't wait. Don't wait till something gets bad. Don't wait till it turns into a problem. Let's be more preventative. We want to be more preventative in the care, right? So come in and talk with us. We're here to listen. I would say it's just important to be knowledgeable and to recognize that we currently have a maternal mortality crisis in Indiana. Mm -hmm. It needs to be addressed. We need to do better. Mm -hmm. And especially in the realm of healthcare disparities, we need to acknowledge that black women have far worse outcomes in this state mm -hmm. and we need to change it. Mm -hmm. Like Keep moving forward, you. right? Mm -hmm. That's all right. we can do. Thank ladies, you, ladies, thank you so much for being here today. Thank Great you. conversation. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this Wish TV Health Spotlight special. We want to make sure that you keep this conversation going. You keep educating your neighbors just like how we want to do for you. You can actually watch it all again on our website at wishtv.com. We have all the information mm -hmm. that you need to know. And remember, be encouraged. Have a great rest of your evening. We'll see you back here tonight at 10 and 11, of course, always online at wishtv.com.